Hey, Salvador Bregman here, and welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified podcast. On this podcast, we share what works when it comes to crowdfunding. And I would say in a much broader sense, I bring on individuals, entrepreneurs, startup founders who are really going after uh, their dreams on this show. And every single week they come on, they share with you exactly how they did it, how they accomplished it, how they moved forward through their obstacles and were able to actually have a result or have a positive impact on the world. And uh, I think that in doing this, a lot of people can sometimes call you crazy if you want to impact the world in a big way. And I think that so many people as well maybe would say things like, ah, this guy can't do it, or there's no way that you could actually build a big business from scratch. So today I wanted to bring on a couple of startup experts who are going to be sharing with you advice that you can then employ into building your business to its height. Now, I'm really speaking on this episode to people who are looking to build a large company. If you want to build a business that you can one day sell to someone else, or you want to build a business and one day go IPO to do an initial public offering, or even offer shares to the public through something like WeFunder or Start Engine, that's really what I'm tailoring today's podcast episode for. And even if you're trying to do a smaller business, I do think that you will get a lot of value out of some of the uh, advice, hacks, tips, uh, and strategies that are shared on today's episode. Keep in mind that when we think about business, you don't necessarily have to be the smartest person in the room. In fact, if you are the smartest person in the room, it maybe means you need to surround yourself with better company. The cool thing about being a business owner is that you can almost assemble a dream team around your vision and your goals as a creator, as an inventor, or as a startup founder. You can have people that are working towards your vision and that are executing in a relentless way with skills that might even be better than yours. But the key is, how do you get started and how do you move forward in a big way? How do you think big? How do you act on these big visions that you want to have and really make a commitment to take control and take responsibility of your life? And in that way, see, take action and see results over a sustained period of time. If you're willing to grow, you're willing to live a life of discomfort. Listen to this episode because I'm telling you the end is in sight. It is possible. There is a brighter, stronger, more rich future. And if you're willing to go through the fire in order to get there, it will be waiting for you on the other side. So I hope you enjoy uh, today's style of podcast. And if you do, give me a positive rating and review on iTunes. Definitely hope you enjoy it. Give me a thumbs up if you are listening on YouTube. And at the end of this episode, I will also share with you a way that we can work together towards this vision if that's something that you're interested in. So in a second here, let's get right into the episode. It's coming up right now. Startups are all consuming. If you start a startup, it will take over your life to a degree that you cannot imagine. Um, and if it succeeds, it will take over your life for a long time, for several years at the very least, maybe a decade, maybe the rest of your working life. So there's a real opportunity cost here. It may seem to you that Larry Page has an enviable life, but there are parts of it that are definitely unenviable. The way the world looks to him is that he started running as fast as he could at age 25, and he has not stopped to catch his breath since. Every day, shit happens within the Google empire that only the emperor can deal with, and he, as the emperor, has to deal with it. If he goes on vacation for even a week, a whole backlog of shit accumulates, and he has to bear this uncomplainingly because, number one, as the company's daddy, he can never show fear or weakness, and number two, if you're a billionaire, you get zero, actually less than zero sympathy if you complain about having a difficult life. <laughs> Which has this strange side effect that the difficulty of being a successful startup founder is concealed from almost everyone who's done it. People who win the 100 meters in the Olympics, like they walk up to them and they're going like, <laughs> right? And like Larry Page is doing that too, but you never get to see it. I was living six guys in a three bedroom apartment and I was sleeping on the floor it was the rattiest, nastiest shithole you've ever seen in your life. I mean, and I literally didn't have a closet, didn't have a drawer. All my shit was in a pile on the floor. I had my one towel that I stole from Motel 6 that had a hole in it that was mine. Um, and so I was trying to grind it out and learn tech, which I really realized that I loved. And I made the, one day I called up my boss and I said, well, I've got this deal I'm going to close. Now it's $1,500 commission to me, which meant I can move out of the shittle. <laughs> and, and so I said, 
Now, one of my responsibilities was to open up the retail store, you know, make sure the door was open, the floors were clean and all that kind of stuff. I said, look, I've got this big deal. I want to close it. And he said, no, you need to be at the store. I'm like, I got someone to watch. He goes, no, you need to be at the store. So I made the executive decision that if I went and picked up a $15,000 check for this company, um, your business software, he would see the light and all would be good. And I'd have my $1,500 commission. Fired my ass. And so he fired me. And so there I was, still in the shithole with my one Motel 6 towel um, and no bedrooms. And so it was then that we started Micro Solutions, and I had no money. And so I went to this company called Architectural Lighting, and I said, look, I got nothing. But I know you were trying, you're, you want this time in billing software. If you front me the $500, I'm going to start this company, and I promise you that I'll make it work. And if I can't make it work, I'll walk your dog, I'll wash you know, your car, I'll do whatever to make it up to you. Just trust me and give me the shot. They did, I took that $500, bought the, spent $250 on the software, got that to work really fast, and then asked for referrals and built this company that then went on to become one of the first companies that did local area network. This was the early 80s, and then went wide area networks, and as you said, we sold it to CompuServe. And along the way, I kept on reinvesting and one day I went to the ATM and I had all zeros, you know, which, which was not fun. But like you said, we, we ended up building it. We had $36 million revenue run rate and sold it to CompuServe, which is part of H&R Block. There's two things that we look really, really hard for. I mean, there's, there's kind of the surface level stuff you look for. So you look for a huge market, um, you look for, you know, differentiating technology and you look for, you know, incredible people. Um, I think in practice, I think that we collectively and certain, we specifically and then we collectively VCs, I think we probably, we, we spend a lot of time talking about markets and technology and we have lots of opinions and I'm not sure that those opinions are actually all that relevant all that often. Um, I think probably the decision ultimately is and should be around people um, as like 90% of the decision. Um, the two things we really zero in on on people are, um, you know, two things. They sound simple. They end up being very difficult. Um, courage and genius. Um, courage is the one we talk about a lot because it's the one that people can learn. Um, uh, you know, courage, courage, which is to say not giving up in the face of adversity, um, you know, just being absolutely determined to succeed, you know, is something that you can, you can like force yourself to do. It can be very painful. You can force yourself to do it. The genius part is a little bit hard to force yourself to do. Um, you know, courage without genius might not get you where you need to go, but genius without courage almost certainly won't. Um, and so we're looking for some kind of magic combination of genius and courage. You know, there's there's a there's a one of our one of my partners quotes quotes Nietzsche a lot on these stuff. He says it's 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 a will to it's will to power. It's it's um, uh, you know it's people who simply will not stop. Um, and and by the way, right? There's always been this kind of thing in Silicon Valley of like you know sort of this I call it the failure fetish, right? It's failure is good, right? Failure. You tell you guys are probably all have been taught this, heard about this from a lot of people. Like failure is a wonderful thing. Failure teaches you all this stuff, and it's great to fail a lot. Like, and we don't like buy any of that. Um, we think that's all complete complete nonsense. We think failure sucks. Um, we think failure is a terribly, terribly depressing thing to go through. Uh, we think success, on the other hand, is wonderful. Um, I, you know, you wouldn't think that this is something you have to actually say out loud, but um, we, we do find it to be clarifying uh, when we point it out. Um, and so we are strongly biased towards people who are so determined to succeed that they just, they never give up, they never quit. So the invention, the idea for arm tights is literally just, I mean, there's so much that comes from being a frustrated consumer. So I'm a woman, I'm looking at my closet, most of my favorite things are sleeveless, like a sleeveless shirt, a sleeveless dress, and I'm like, you know what, I wanna wear that differently and I also wanna wear it year round. So I just want something that goes underneath, on my arms, super simple in lots of different colors, I don't want to always have to put a cardigan or a jacket or something over it come fall or winter or when you're transitioning in spring or even inside of office buildings. I'm cold a lot. And I don't want the integrity of my shirt or my dress to be covered up. So that's how arm tights. It's a little crop top made on a hosiery tights machine, which had never been done before. And you put it on over your head. It stops just below your bra. And the reason that is for that is less bulk under your clothes. It's super breathable, easy to wear. And then it's just literally like with one $30 item, your whole closet exponentially grows with looks and how you want to layer it and wear it. I love it. But yeah, ideas clearly, are, you know, Clearly, I love it. I have, uh, my, my, my assistant, who's my right hand, Lisa, she's been uh, my right hand for 16 years, can attest to this, but I have 99 pages. I don't know why it's 99, but it's, she told me the other day, it's 99 pages, single space typed of ideas. 
<laughs> I need one more idea. So um, I, e I think of ideas constantly on airplanes and car, you know, talking to somebody and I email it to myself and then I just keep them and log them. And then also your willingness to get the job done, like um, kind of navigating and doing what it takes. And, um, and so, I, I, yeah, I've, there's so much about my journey where I was like, I am not going to let the outcome or my success be contingent on other people as much as I can control it, help it, navigate it, I'm going to. So, um, so yeah, in the beginning, especially still now, I mean, obviously I'm hustling. I'm like at the, at this, where I am now and I'm running around the airport asking people to follow me on Instagram, you know? Uh, I, just, I just feel like it's innate in me also to a degree. Um, but the, uh, in the beginning, ex like there's a few examples that come to mind. You mentioned that I paid my, I called my friends and asked them to go buy Spanx and I wrote everybody checks and sent them a check. Um, because I needed to drive momentum. And I had no money to advertise, so I'm like, this product's gonna sit on the shelf, so I needed to get people to go in and buy it. I also, when I went into the stores, I realized very quickly that my product was in the sleepiest part of the department store. It was back in the corner and nobody was going there. So then I immediately um, uh, went to Target and I bought um, envelope dividing, dividers that you put on your home desk. And I ran around Neiman Marcus and put them at every register. And I put Spanx in them. And then I walked away. <laughs> and <laughs> Neiman's has like impeccable visual rules and regulations. And, um, and I did that because I had to get my product out of the department. And because I did that, women in shoes started buying Spanx and women in contemporary. And, and um, those decisions made such a big difference. And by the time somebody figured out that nobody else had approved it, because you know everybody thought somebody else approved it, um, it was so successful that the head of Neiman's was like, whatever this girl's doing, let her keep doing it. I mean, I have so many stories like that of, of just, what do I need to do? There's a friend of mine who's got a good saying, which is that starting a company is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. Okay, that's, um, that's generally what happens because um, when you first start a company, there's lots of optimism and things, things are great. And then, so happiness at first is high. Then you, you encounter all sorts of issues uh, and happiness will steadily decline. <laughs> and then you will go through a whole world of hurt. <laughs> but, and then eventually, you'll, if you succeed, and in most cases, you will not succeed. Um, and, and Tesla almost didn't succeed, came very close to failure. Um, then if, if you succeed, then after a long time, you will finally get back to happiness. <laughs> I think too is you've got to make sure that that you that whatever you're doing is a great product or service. It, it has to be really great. And I go back to what I was saying earlier, where um, if you're a new company, I mean, unless it's like some new industry or or new market that if it's an untapped market, or then then uh, you have more ability to, you know, this, this, the standard is lower for your product or service. But if you're entering anything where there's an existing marketplace against large entrenched competitors, then your product or service needs to be much better than theirs. It can't be a little bit better because then you put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and they say, why would you buy it as a consumer? You're always going to buy the trusted brand unless there's a big difference. So a lot of times, uh, you know, entrepreneur will come up with something which is only slightly better, mm. um, and it's it's not it can't just be slightly better. It's got to be a lot better. Uh, number three, I'd say is constantly seek criticism. Yeah. Uh, a a well a well thought out critique of whatever you're doing is as valuable as gold, um, and you should seek that from everyone you can, but particularly your friends. Um, usually your friends know what's wrong, but they don't want to tell you because they don't want to hurt you. Um, so they lift you up sort of your, uh, yeah, yeah, so they you know, say, oh, I wouldn't encourage my friend, so I'm, gonna t I'm not going to tell him what I think is wrong with this product. Yeah. It doesn't mean your friends are right, uh, but very often they are right. Mm. Um, and you at least want to listen very carefully to what they say.
If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight, and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com slash checklist. Fulfillright.com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. Yeah, it, it is amazing when you really think about, all right, I want to, what do I want to learn? Um, a classic thing to learn is will customers sign up for my product at all? If it was already built, if I already had it perfect, you know, would they want to buy it from me? Well, easiest way to do that test is to put up a single one-page landing page where we describe what the product is, that we pretend we're, we've already built it, and simply say, would you like to pre-order this product right now? In most cases, when I've done that test, I didn't even have to make page two where I apologize that the product doesn't exist because mm -hmm. nobody even wants it. Mm -hmm. um, it's also possible to build a much less functional prototype than you would normally think about, you know, an engineer building. Uh, the key is to try to simulate as much of the experience for customers as possible. So uh, there's a very famous company called Dropbox that today is one of Silicon Valley's hottest companies. They had this very complicated technology for file sharing that they were trying to build. And the whole idea was it would give you this magical experience that just worked across all your computers, magic synchronization. And the way they built their MVP was not with an ounce of technology. They just made a video a video of this kind of prototype that they had done built on their computer that made it look like it would work like magic. Mm -hmm. But the video showed you what the experience would be, and then they used the video to get people, again, to sign up, to pre-order, to commit to be part of their community. Mm -hmm. And that was enough, without any technology, to show them they were on the right track. And how do, when you run that kind of pre-product experiment, how do you know what number of signups contributes to success, <laughs> and what number below what number constitutes uh, an opportunity, a need to rethink. Yeah. There's no absolute number that matters. Uh, it, it matters, you know, how do those numbers plug into your overall business model? So it's important to make a prediction about what it's supposed to be. You know, if I'm selling a product that's extremely expensive, I might only need a handful of customers in order to build a profitable business, and so getting only a handful of customers to sign up would be a very important indication. Uh, I was just talking to a, uh, an entrepreneur who had read my book and was kind of sharing their story with me, and they told me about they were building this clean tech product that was incredibly expensive and complicated, and they were really in trouble, business about to run out of money, you know, CEO quit, it was really a dire situation. And all they had was a prototype that only could convert to energy one-tenth the volume that they were planning to build. And after reading the book and hearing about minimum viable product, he thought, you know, what if we offered the prototype for sale? He said, all right, we're going to charge $2.7 million for this prototype, and they put it up for sale, and he instantly got 10 orders. So he went from a company about to go bankrupt in the brink of disaster to a company with $27 million in bookings. You know, just from that one thing to say, hey, is it possible to sell this prototype? Well, that was a very big success. A, com a company is a, a group of people, uh, and that really is all a company is. Um, uh, and so if you're going to have a group of people together, they must be happy people. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're going to be happy people, uh, they've got to be led by somebody who is happy themselves, um, who loves people, uh, who cares generally about people, and um, who looks, looks for the best in people, who uh, is somebody who doesn't criticize, uh, but who praises and, and brings out the best in people. So, um, so we look for people who are, uh, you know, are great leaders of people because they um, because they genuinely care about people and, uh, and, um, and I think, you know, we, we're lucky at Virgin that those, that's the kind of people we've got. Now, if a company brings in somebody into a company that's not that kind of person, uh, they can destroy a company very quickly. If you destroy the morale in a company, it's very, very difficult to get that morale back. Um, and so we try generally to promote from within our companies, so we know people's strengths and weaknesses before we, before we promote them. Um, we do sometimes bring people in from outside and you know, we, we, we try very hard to, you know, uh, to make sure that they're the kinds of people that we'll get on with.
When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and your your life is just to live your life inside the world. Try not to bash into the walls too much. Uh, uh, try to have a nice family life. Uh, have fun. Save a little money. Um, but life – that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it. Um, that's maybe the most important thing is to shake off this, uh, th this, uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. So we launched in New York, or we didn't even launch. I mean, we launched anywhere that you could access the internet, basically, and there was Google Maps. But New York was the big city we launched in. The thing is that we were a travel product in New York, which meant, unlike other companies where the supply and demand, like Uber, the drivers and riders in New York. On Airbnb, the hosts were in New York, but the travelers came from all over the world. So people all over the world would hear about and discover homes in New York. They would travel to New York, and they'd also travel to San Francisco, and then they'd go back to their city, and they'd spread the idea. But the other thing is they would go from a guest to a host. And so the network naturally grew, um, but we also targeted events. So, you know, um, we targeted the Democratic National Convention. We built D.C. through the inauguration in 2009. Um, we built... Um, we were focused on music festivals and concerts. So uh, the World Cup, the Olympics, these are early, not the most recent one, but the one before. So events in PR were probably the main ways that we bootstrapped. And then we built this one-click post to Craigslist tool that Craigslist allows us to do until they shut it off like a couple years into it. But we allowed hosts to basically, we built a tool where they could, with a single click of a button, click and distribute their post to Craigslist to get more distribution. And so the listings would get relisted onto Craigslist and they would feed feedback. We started doing a little bit of Google advertising. But the main way it grew was through word of mouth and PR. So the first point is that when you're doing a regulation crowdfunding campaign, when you're doing a WeFunder campaign, an equity crowdfunding campaign, the biggest difference between doing this and something like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, which is where it's more of like a pre-order campaign, we're actually selling product online. The biggest difference is that you are giving away equity, right? You're giving away equity in your company. You're technically selling securities online. Now, you might not be doing a price round necessarily, right? You might be doing a crowd save or something like that, but you're technically kind of securing selling securities online, right? So when it comes to equity crowdfunding, when it comes to WeFunder, that's really the biggest difference between that and doing more of a Kickstarter Indiegogo campaign. It can be very confusing though, and there's a lot of overlap because you can have perks as well, or gifts, if you will, rewards that also are tied with a WeFunder campaign. So for example, you could be giving away equity in a service or a company, right? And also have that be a reward where, for example, you know, let's just say you're doing like a new uh, app where you can go and you can rent bikes or something like that, right? And you're building a company around that. You could also have as a reward that you get a monthly pass to be able to ride bikes wherever you want to in your city, or you can have a yearly pass and be giving that way if you someone invests like a thousand bucks, right? So when it comes to WeFunder, that is the biggest difference is that you are actually giving away equity in your company. You actually have to be willing to do that as well. And that's all really based around what's your value? What the heck are you valuing this company at, man, right? So your valuation is gonna determine to a lot of people whether or not it's actually a good investment from the get-go, right? So you have to be willing to actually value your company, right? And, and thinking about your industry, thinking about what you're doing, thinking about the technology, et cetera. You have to be willing to give away a portion of equity in your company. I know everyone, when I say giving away equity, the first thing that most entrepreneurs think about is like, oh no, I'm giving away control, right? Well, if you think about it, you know, you're only giving away a certain portion of equity. So you can kind of discuss that. You can look more into that. That kind of goes beyond the scope of this video, but you do have to be willing to do it. You have to be willing to bring in investment capital. And that's the big difference as well is that investment capital, you can spend that how you like, right? So you could spend that on marketing or advertising. You could spend it on HR salaries, whatever. When you're doing a Kickstarter, 
campaign, you're really selling that product and you're having to spend a lot of those funds and actually delivering that product to the end group, right? So when it comes to this, you have to be willing to actually give away equity. You have to also be willing to value your company so that equity has some kind of worth and some way that investors can actually judge that. And the last thing that I would say when it comes to this is also not just viewing this as being like a win-lose. It's like, oh, I gotta give away equity, I gotta give away ownership, I don't wanna do this, right? Really thinking as well about partnering with these people. Who is it that you're gonna bring into the company? All these potential people who have many different networks, who can spread the world, who can become your evangelist, your brand ambassadors, all these different things. So you're not just giving away equity, right? You're also kind of building a community at the same time. However, when it comes to this, you know, giving away equity, really thinking through that. Is that something, a path that you want to go to? Because once you begin that journey, you gotta make a big project, right? You gotta make a really big company. You gotta be committed to having a good exit or a good liquidity event in the future so that all those investors can cash out at a certain point in time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Team is Fine podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman and commend you so much for showing up today uh, and showing up every single week when it comes to this episode, being willing to dream big, to have ambitions, to become success oriented in your life and to stop playing small. It's so difficult sometimes just to say yes to life, to say yes to opportunities and to be willing to achieve something big because in some ways achieving a big goal takes the same amount of effort as achieving a small goal. So I think that in terms of the big picture here, the idea is that how do we put you on a track to be successful in your life, to become success oriented, no matter how you describe that. And chances are you, you got to step outside of your comfort zone if you want to get to where you are. Maybe you know that you can do more than what it is that you're doing. You know that you're capable of more. That actually happened to me once when I was a bit younger. Um, this is actually, I think when I was just going into college and it was the first time I ever met an entrepreneur. It's the first time I ever met a real business person. Ever since when I grew up, uh, I always looked at people who became, you know, more of like a profession, like a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist or an accountant or a psychologist. And I really thought that was the only path which I could take in life because that's the people that were, you know, I was surrounding myself with or the, the professions that I was seeing. And you go to school, you go to a school in, you know, education, high school or middle school or even in college. And these schools do not talk about the potential to become your own boss, the potential to become a startup founder or an entrepreneur, or even how to go about doing that. So for many of us, we don't realize that we really have that bug until we start working, until we start getting our own projects out there. And that was the same for me. But one day I was lucky enough to have a friend of mine who had built a pretty medium sized or decent sized company. They had around 50 to 75 employees in the New York area. And uh, there was just based around an e-commerce company. And I was so lucky because my friend actually introduced me to them. This was a grandfather and I was able to do a meeting with them. And I really went into that meeting so anxious, so excited. This is the first time I was ever meeting a real founder, a real entrepreneur. So I went into this meeting and I, I couldn't help but ask him like, how did you get here? You know, how did you do this? And, you know, he took for a second to kind of pause. Uh, and this is much, you know, as an older guy who's definitely uh, more seasoned in his years, he's gone through a couple of different businesses and I'll never forget what he said. And he said that, you know, you just got to believe in yourself, right? You just got to be willing to believe that this is possible. And the second thing he said is kind of made me laugh a little bit, which is, and you got to advertise, right? <laughs> you got to believe in yourself and you got to advertise. And, you know, he told me a couple of other things as well in that conversation that really stuck with me. But um, that never that, that really left an impression on me, that experience of being able to talk to someone who had been there and done it and thus allowed me to have much more belief and confidence in starting my own business. And I've always wanted to provide a, a bit of a similar or bite sized experience for other creators out there. So whether you're interested in starting your own business, using crowdfunding as a method to get funding and validation for your product, or even considering other forms like equity crowdfunding, right? In order to raise capital for your startup company, I do offer a service, which is my one-on-one -on -one individual intensive coaching calls with me. If you've been listening to this podcast and you want to speed up your success, if you want to move forward 
in your life and get more education and information about crowdfunding, about how to do this, about your strategy, about execution, and even talk about other ways that I can maybe help you in your vision here and in your goals, go and check out my individual one-on-one coaching call option at crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching. You can fill out that form and we can get that call scheduled ASAP. Regardless of where you are in your journey, always try to seek out these mentors because I'm telling you, it's going to make it it's so much easier for you to actually understand what to do next, but also it's going to feel much more real. When you when you when I walked into his facility and actually saw this office, right, of someone who has like 40 plus, you know, 50 employees or more, and also uh, as well a fulfillment team that was working with this e-commerce company, it was so cool because I realized like this guy did this out of nothing, this is possible. You got to believe yourself and you got to advertise, right? So some great lessons. Thank you so much. My name is Sal or Salvador Brigman. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Give me a positive rating and review and I will see you next time.